Welcome back to Bumblebee, everyone, where today's mission is to get those eyes misty with some of the top 10 haunting last words in history. So buckle up, this is about to get real tender. Hard to rank last moments of very different people, so consider this list by no means in any order, but more like a collection I'm presenting. Let's start with David A. Johnston. As one of the first members of the US Geological Survey monitoring team that arrived at Mount St. Helens and the scientist in charge of volcanic gas studies, David spent long hours working on and close to the mountain. The eruption had been unfolding slowly since the first earthquakes were detected on March 16th of 1980. The north face of the mountain was literally bulging out by six feet every day. What nobody knew is when the mountain would erupt and how much warning they would have. It was none. The volcano monitoring of effort of which Dave was a part of actually helped persuade authorities first to limit access around the area of the volcano and then to resist the heavy pressure to reopen it as businesses began threatening to sue officials over the loss of funds. This action held the May 18th death toll to under 20 people instead of hundreds or thousands. On May 18, 1980, with no warning in the slightest, the sudden eruption was best summed up by Johnston's own last words, which are said to sound more excited than fearful. Over the radio to colleagues based in Vancouver, Washington, miles away, David began to shout, Vancouver, Vancouver, this is it, this is. And then there was nothing. He was literally blasted off the mountain ridge that he was on and his body was never found. And how could I not bring up some of the most famous words ever spoken? It's Vincent Van Gogh. I am part of the collective that does not believe that Van Gogh actually took his life. There's genuinely way too much evidence against it. The accepted understanding of what happened in Auvers among the people who knew him and lived there at the time was that he was accidentally killed by a couple of youths he'd talked to sometimes and he decided to protect them by saying he'd done it himself. Renowned art historian John Rewald recorded that version of events when he visited Auvers in the 1930s and other details found corroborate that story. On July 27, 1980, a bang went off in the wheat field where Vincent and these youngins would meet up to drink beers and have chats. Vincent made it back to his room at the inn where his brother Theo is alerted of the mass injury to his abdomen. Theo arrives on the 28th and sat with Vincent until he passed around 1.30 p.m. on the 29th. In a letter to sister Elizabeth, Theo wrote Vincent van Gogh's last words. He himself wanted to die when I sat at his bedside and said that we would try to get him better and hope that he would be then spared this kind of despair. He said, the sadness will last forever. I understood what he wanted to say with those words. A few moments later, he felt suffocated and within one minute, he closed his eyes. A playwright? No wonder he left so theatrically. It's Wilson Misner. Wilson Misner is noted for many quips. Be nice to people on the way up because you'll meet the same people on the way down. Never give a sucker an even break. And when you steal from one author, it's plagiarism. If you steal from many, it's research. Misner has suffered the same fate as Dorothy Parker. Both are vividly remembered today for their witty repartee rather than for specific literary works. Misner was an American playwright, racketeer, and entrepreneur. Around 1931, Warner Bros. head producer Daryl Zanuck hired Misner to work as a top screenplay writer for the studio's first national film. While at the studio, Misner did what he did at best as a pretentious creative, be unbearable and have hardly any respect for authority. As a result, he found it hard to work with the studio boss Jack Warner, who also shared this personality. Misner, however, would grow in success, intellect, and produce some of their biggest movies. Sassy until the end, Misner was brought a priest whilst on his deathbed who kept bugging at him to talk, finally saying, I'm sure you want to talk to me. Sure enough, Misner's only reaction was to scoff and say, why would I want to talk to you? I've just been talking to your boss. Before promptly dying right then and there, April 3rd of 1933. Death penalty will always remain a debate of rights and wrongs. Patrick Brian Knight. In 1991, Knight made a very bad decision. Breaking into his neighbor's home with accomplice Robert Bradfield, they locked Walter and Mary in their own basement while using their vehicle to drive around to different banks to try and gain access to the hostage couple's account. It didn't work, so they killed the couple and left him in a ditch. In response to his upcoming death penalty due in 2007, Knight's friends set up a website on his behalf called Dead Man Laughing. Knight had decided he wanted his last words to be a joke. The website brought in over 1,300 letters worth of jokes, an effort on Knight's part to boost the morale of the Texas death row, he said. The inmates were able to open all the jokes and share them amongst each other. I don't think the point was to trivialize it, said his attorney Paul Manser. They've had 17 deaths and we're in the 25th week of the year. They see these people go and they're people they know and communicate with. They have a camaraderie together, so it's really just for them. Patrick Brian Knight on June 26, 2007 did not tell a joke. His voice was wavering and appearing to hold back tears. He thanked God for his friends and made a plea on behalf of certain fellow death row inmates. He claimed were actually innocent of their crimes. Then in his last moments he said, and the other joke is that I am not Patrick Brian Knight and y'all can't stop this execution now. Go ahead, I'm finished. When life is all numbers and formulas, I guess you have to make your own fun. That's what 
Richard B. Mellon did. For decades, actually. Richard and his brother Andrew played a game of tag for seven effing decades. Imagine that. Richard first served under Andrew at Mellon Bank and then assumed its presidency in 1921 when Andrew was appointed treasury secretary. But they were still playing tag in their big boy professions, chasing each other around when they had a spare minute to be kids again. Whether it was funerals, weddings, graduations, while at the grocery store with mom running into each other on an errand. It was non-stop. Any chance to tag your it, these guys took it. The game didn't stop until December 1st of 1933. Richard B. Mellon lay bedridden and naturally requested his beloved brother. When Andrew came into his room and sat beside him, Richard raised his hand one last time, tapping Andrew's arm and said last tag. He passed away shortly after and his brother Andrew remained it until he died four years later. His last words held painful yet unintentional truth as Jackie Wilson never imagined they'd be his last. On September 29th in 1975, Jackie Wilson was performing as part of Dick Clark's Rock and Roll Review in New Jersey. It's while literally singing the lines, my heart is crying, crying, from his signature song, Lonely Teardrops, Wilson has a literal heart attack and fell and hit his head. Medical personnel save his life, but the lack of oxygen to his brain had already done damage, and he's left in a semi-coma state for nine years before dying on January 1st, 1984. What hits so deeply about Jackie's lyrical last words was his troubled life. He fought addiction, and his womanizing led to an angry lover shooting him in 1961. During the height of his career, he had to play to segregated audiences in the South and even once had the New Orleans police arrest and beat him after they disapproved of a performance. In 1970, his teenage son is killed by a neighbor during an argument. In the early 1970s, though, he's pulling it together. Wilson started turning his life around. He gave up alcohol and substances and the manager who caused his financial problems. And then he had the heart attack. By the time he died, Wilson was penniless and buried in an unmarked grave in Detroit like a pauper to be forgotten. Thankfully, Jackie was remembered. He's inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1987 and inspires Elvis and Van Morrison. And his grave is now marked, including the words, no more lonely teardrops. It's enough to make your heart tremble. It's fly high. Reddit is a treasure trove of obscure, the quirky, the intimate. While you never truly have context who is leaving their stories and their marks, it seems to be part of the whimsical effect. Reddit user Gilly Billy was one of thousands who responded to a Reddit thread that inquired people to share the last words they'd heard in their times as an EMT or from a loved one. For Gilly Billy, whomever they are, it was the statement, looks like a good night to fly. The Reddit user's great uncle had said this to his brother whilst laying in his hospital bed before slipping away. Said great uncle had flown for the Navy in World War II. Surviving the war, he flew commercial jets for 30 years afterwards. He had an obvious passion for flight, for being amongst the clouds and the stars, and I hope he had a beautiful trip there. There are such thin boundaries that divide us as humans, but death is something that will always unify us. Next up is the killing of Che Guevara. The Argentine-born doctor and Marxist rebel leader who helped Fidel Castro seize power in Cuba, Che Guevara, abruptly resigned from his government positions and left Cuba to spread revolution in Africa and South America. But the missions, including the one that led to the uprising in Bolivia, were all doomed. October 8, 1967, Guevara is taken prisoner and carried by soldiers to a one-room schoolhouse about four miles from where he's captured. Felix Rodriguez, a Cuban-American CIA operative posing as Bolivian military officer, would find him covered in dirt inside that schoolhouse the next day. The US government wanted him alive to be interrogated, but Bolivian leaders decided that Guevara had to be killed, as a public trial would only garner him sympathy. The official story would be that he was killed in battle. Rodriguez, who was instrumental in Guevara's capture, had mixed emotions at the time, as he had acknowledged later in an interview. He was the man who had killed so many of his countrymen, Rodriguez said, and yet he felt sorry for him. So he told the guerrilla leader that he was about to die. I looked at him straight in the face and just told him. He looked straight to me and said, it's better this way. I should have never been captured alive. Rodriguez says the two men shook hands. He embraced me. I embraced him. Then Rodriguez left, ordering a soldier to aim below the neck so that way it would fit the official story that he had died in combat. Guevara's last words were to Sergeant Jamie Turan, the soldier ordered to kill him. I know you've come to kill me, he said. Shoot, coward. You're only going to kill a man. This is another Reddit find that goes straight for the jaw. When things get hard. I'm not sure who it happened to or even their names. It was a response to the same Reddit inquiry as the pilot story and this time by user Siluan. I had to tell my grandmother that dialysis would only give her another week or so to live. And it was her choice to try or not. She was in and out of consciousness at that point, but she was still in a clear state for the moment. She asked, will I die? I said yes. She looked me in the eyes, smiled a little, and said, sometimes you've got to do what you don't want to do. She closed her eyes, squeezed my hand, and slept until she passed the next day. When things get hard, I always hear her say, sometimes you've got to do things you don't want to do. And if you weren't already crying, let me hit you with the death of Marvin Gaye. At the peak of his career, Marvin Gaye was the Prince of Motown. 
Motown, the soulful voice behind hits as wide ranging as How Sweet It Is To Be Loved By You and Mercy Mercy Me. Like his label mate Stevie Wonder, Gabe both epitomized and outgrew the crowd pleasing sound that made Motown famous, moving successfully from the upbeat pop to message music to satin cheat soul. But as the critic Michael Eric Dyson put it, the man who chased away the demons of millions with his heavenly sound and divine arts was chased by his own demons throughout his life. That life came to a tragic end on April 1st, 1984, when Marvin Gaye was killed by his own father one day short of his 45th birthday. Marvin Sr. harbored some serious issues and envy over his son's tremendous success, and Marvin Jr. clearly harbored unresolved feelings towards his incredibly terrible and violent father. Those feelings spilled out for the final time in the Los Angeles home of Marvin Gaye Sr. and his wife Alberta. After an argument between his father and Alberta escalated, Marvin Jr. got into a physical fight with his father on that morning. Alberta Gay was trying to calm her son in his bedroom. He's reported to have said, Mother, I'm going to get my things and get out of this house. Father hates me and I'm never coming back. Just before Marvin Sr. took a weapon given to him by Marvin Jr. and shot him three times in the chest. Marvin Gaye's brother Frankie, who lived next door and who held the legendary singer in his final minutes, later wrote in his memoir that Marvin Gaye's final disturbing statement was, I got what I wanted. I couldn't do it myself, so I made him do it. This is the end of our video. If someone you know or yourself is experiencing mental health crisis, remember you aren't alone no matter how corny it sounds. So many of us struggle and too many last words are spoken too soon. Please call 988 in the US or plus 1-833-456-4566 and talk to someone if you need help, relief, or just a shoulder to cry on. Thank you again for watching and be sure to like and subscribe if you want to see more from us. And until next time, you are so loved.